Joining us now is Richard Fadden, former Deputy Minister of Defense, former CSIS Director, and former National Security Advisor. Mr. Fadden, thank you for joining us again. Good to be with you. Listen, I want to start here uh, with Mr. Chong's uh, assertion that these attempts by foreign actors to interfere would not have happened uh, if Canada had a better system of publicizing the names of agents or diplomats who try to influence or intimidate members of parliament. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? Well, I agree in general. I think it's never possible to state with absolute certainty that you could have avoided something like that. But I do think if we'd had a foreign agents uh, registry system, if we if foreign interference were a crime, and if generally speaking, I think if the government had attached more importance to the general issue of foreign intel uh, foreign interference, rather, I think the chances would have been much less that he would have been subjected to the interference that he was. Now, Mr. Chong also says that the uh, current structure of NSCOP is insufficient. Right now, it's uh, made up of MPs and senders selected by the prime minister, as you know. And Mr. Chong wants that to come under the purview of Parliament with more frequent reports on foreign interference. I'm wondering what your assessment of that would be. Would that actually serve as a better deterrent against foreign interference? Well, I'm not sure how it would have that immediate impact. Uh, also, Mr. Chung's suggesting, suggestion is really uh, going to one of the more fundamental principles of our parliamentary system, which is that Parliament and parliamentary committees do not have access to classified information except with the specific approval of a minister or of the prime minister. So moving NSCOP to become a regular parliamentary committee, giving it access to all of the things that it has access to right now, would change this really basic principle. It may be worth doing this, uh, but I think there's more involved here than just shifting it to a committee of parliament. I think generally speaking, um, Canadians, the Can Canadian government's plural, have been much, much more reticent than Australians or uh, the Brits to make national security information available. So I don't know if it's necessary to go that far. If after looking at all the ramifications, it was considered to be a useful thing to do, that's fine. But one of the things we have to remember is that national security secrets will remain national security secrets. And the, the members of the committee would not be able to use that information in their partisan byplay in Parliament. So there's a balancing act here to, find, to be found somewhere. Okay, balancing act. I'm wondering if it's through an example, because you, you mentioned both Australia and, and the UK. Can you describe uh, for us what they actually do and how Canada might benefit from that? Well, both of them, uh, Australia in particular, has a foreign uh, agents registration program. So I think that's now being considered actively by the government and probably will end up with one. I don't think that's a, a silver bullet, but it will certainly go some distance, I think, to making things easier. In terms of making uh, classified information available to Parliament, both Australia and the United Kingdom have permanent committees, standing committees, special committees that are set up in order to receive this kind of information. But overlying this is a greater reluctance on the, pa on the part of the UK and the Australian governments to talk about these things. And I think it's a good example of how you can talk about national security issues by aggregating them up a level or two uh, and thereby protecting the secrets while, while making the basic point. So all around this, I do believe Mr. Chung is right and others are correct when they say that greater transparency, greater, pub greater public information would be beneficial. The more we talk about this, I think the more we will be alert to the possibility of foreign interference and the less likely it will be that uh, people like the former consular official in Toronto and others will, will succeed. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Chong also wants uh, the Procedures Committee to, to track what happened to that CSIS report that uh, spoke about that expelled diplomat, uh, Zhao Wei, uh, and also about the intimidation that essentially targeted Mr. Chong's family in Hong Kong. As a former national security advisor, I I'm wondering if you've ever considered what happened here. How is it possible that the report was sent to the Privy Council and to relevant government departments, apparently, uh, but not seen by the Prime Minister or his public safety minister? Well... Acknowledging, first of all, that I haven't seen all this documentation, so I, I am to some degree speculating, but I don't understand that. Uh, uh, all of these departments would have shared this information as a matter of routine with selected members of the political staff who have been designated and cleared to, to see the material. And if indeed it was sent to the PCO, to public safety, uh, to GAC, for example, 
I do not understand why it would not have been sent on to uh, ministers and or the prime minister. Um, it's the only reason I can think of is that the threshold uh, for reporting such things to ministers had not been met, but that would have to be a very, very high threshold, threshold indeed. Certainly when I was CSIS director, if I heard that a parliamentarian uh, was at risk, I would have made sure that the system knew about it. And in fact, that's true of any Canadian. It doesn't matter if it's a parliamentarian, the Cardinal Archbishop of Quebec or the Chief Justice of, of Alberta. Uh, if there's a real threat, something needs to be done, and that may vary in particular circumstances. But when you're dealing with parliamentarians, I think uh, public servants uh, are a bit reticent to deal with them directly. So the thing to do is to pass it on to ministers and prime ministers. So I don't have an answer to your question. I don't understand why, given the PCO has had, had the material, it was not passed on, certainly to the PMO and even the prime minister himself. You know, uh, it was interesting to, to, again, hear Mr. Chong yesterday because he was talking about how the government's handling or mishandling of the situation essentially diminishes Canada's reputation amongst its security partners, in particular with the Five Eyes. Uh, do you agree with that? I don't think we've been coming, covering ourselves with glory here. Uh, so to a considerable degree, I agree with him. Uh, on the other hand, all of the Five Eyes have had problems in this area over the over the years. But it seems to me that the main issue here has been the relative reluctance of the government to act, not just on Mr. Chung, but on, for example, you know, the NSCOP committee uh, after the 19th election and the 20th election uh, made a series of recommendations. They were not by and large implemented. So there's a certain sense that we're not really moving forward with any sense of urgency to deal with the broad issue. That I think would be worrisome for any democracy. Richard Fadden, always appreciate your thought and your time. Thank you for that. My pleasure.